how do we define the world that we are at now, uh, uh, half a year or more than half a year after the beginning of the pandemic outbreak uh, uh, earlier this spring? Well, I guess uh, we're not in good shape. We're not in good shape. We have not done collectively as uh, well as we should have. In fact, I think there are two narratives that that uh, that have emerged. Um, uh, either the pandemic is teaching nations and leaders that um, uh, faced by such challenges, the best way forward is to uh, pursue a national agenda. That is sort of the make America great again or America first philosophy. Or the second uh, narrative is, uh, and I would hope that that's the one that will prevail as going forward, is that the lesson which the pandemic is teaching us, continues to teach us, is that uh, a national approach won't help much except maybe in the very short term, but that we will emerge stronger and better equipped only uh, if we commit ourselves to a more multilateralist approach um, and overcome uh, this automatic temptation of uh, isolationism and, and, and nationalism. Um, where are we today? Uh, I, I would like to voice uh, one point of optimism. Uh, quite frankly, I think what happened last week, the election of Joe Biden in America, will give a boost to the prevalence to uh, 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 the possible eventual victory of the multilateralist approach. Uh, and uh, I would have taken a somewhat more skeptical or pessimistic uh, view if we had uh, uh, been witnessing a Trump victory. But now I think the forces of multilateralism can reunite between Europe and the United States and others. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, modestly optimistic. I would strongly uh, support the idea that the pandemic has tended to uh, exacerbate, to strengthen uh, pre-existing conditions. Unfortunately, most of the pre-existing conditions were not good ones. Uh, look, two years ago, I published uh, in German uh, a book with the title uh, World in Danger. Uh, an English it, uh, English uh, language version, an adapted English language version, actually is just now coming out, being published in the United States. And uh, the, the title is World in Danger. And I, I describe all the negative uh, trends, the, um, the certainties, the, 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 the certainties which we thought were, were given, were permanent, and which have uh, been falling apart. Let me just give you two or three examples. Uh, we in Europe, and I think that's true for Spanish uh, uh, people, just like for Germans and others, we thought for 70 years that the American nuclear and military protective umbrella, uh, the role of America as a superpower protecting Europe, was going to be there forever. Donald Trump has raised a big, big question mark about the certainty of that. Second, second uh, uh, issue, you know, as a diplomat, I participated in negotiations about the EU treaties. Um, and one of, the f one of the fundamental paragraphs of the EU treaties is about the ever closer union, which we want to pursue as members of the EU. Well, I thought that was a certainty and we could base our policy on that. Now, of course, Brexit has demonstrated that there is no such thing as a certainty about the ever closer union. We have to fight for the for the pursuit and for the success of Europe. And I mean, I could really go on and make this list a lot longer. So the pre-existing conditions 
uh, have been uh, conditions of a world order falling apart, of increasing inequality, of a re uh, starting uh, uh, great power rivalries, of uh, bloody wars uh, that we, the international community, have been unable to stop or to prevent. So the pandemic has simply tended to ac accelerate that, I'm, uh, I'm afraid. And we will be in, in a very critical, I hope the world is not going to be in the intensive care unit next year, but we will be in bad shape economically, politically, strategically, and I hope not militarily. I don't like the uh, term uh, U.S. Chinese Cold War because I think the, in fact, the confrontation which we have seen develop and which, in fact, I believe will continue to exist between the United States and China is somewhat different from the classic Cold War where we had two nuclear superpowers uh, literally threatening each other, uh, you know, with uh, total extinction. It was a um, rivalry to the death, so to speak. Uh, I think the uh, uh, American-Chinese uh, confrontation is somewhat different. Uh, and, and also it is different because the mutual dependencies, economically speaking, are very different, are much more significant. There was hardly any trade be between the United States and the former Soviet Union, uh, negligible. There is a huge uh, investment and trading relationship, uh, uh, of course, and in an enormous debt relationship uh, between the United States and China. So it's a different relationship. But yes, indeed, in fact, uh, the United States uh, both Democrats and Republicans, the senators, uh, the political elites, uh, have a view where they are not divided. And this is a view that uh, uh, this is about whether America will win or whether China will win. And many of my American friends, Republicans and Democrats, feel that if it turns out that China is about to win this economic, uh, uh, political, uh, and maybe at the end of the day also military confrontation, then it must be the mission of the United States to make sure that China will not win quickly, slowing them down, right? So this is quite a, a zero-sum game type of approach to uh, uh, the relationship with China. And this is, of course, quite different from what I perceive as the uh, mainstream European approach to China. I think our European approach to China is based on the hope or on the expectation, uh, I would like to say, that it can and should be possible to create a level playing field between China and the European Union, 450 million Europeans and a billion or more uh, Chinese uh, built uh, based on the idea of reciprocity. Uh, if you give us access to your market, we'll give you access to our market. I think we don't believe in uh, a, uh, you know, historic uh, and lasting and permanent confrontation. I think we continue to believe that uh, th that some kind of cooperative relationship is possible, even as we know that this is, as the EU Commission has said, uh, a systemic rivalry. China as a systemic rival. That is what the EU Commission determined um, in 2019. Um, and I don't disagree with that at all. in the foreseeable future, again, to the uh, Joe Biden victory in the United States, um, populistic approaches to foreign policy and to uh,
policy in general uh, will suffer a, 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 a kind of a setback in the transatlantic, Euro-Atlantic world, because the future American president is the opposite, uh, is at the opposite end of us of the spectrum of the populists. But that doesn't mean that we will see the end of populism uh, around the world. In fact, uh, I think for 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 populist approaches and for polarization uh, dynamics, uh, the um, in uh, the 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 uh, uh, in, enfranchisement, the empowerment of the individual, which the internet, uh, which social social media have created, uh, of course, uh, erase eliminate the monopoly on not only on the use of military power, but the mo monopoly on public opinion, which in the good old days was a monopoly which the states held. Uh, and the states, at the nation state, the governments had very little uh, opposition in this. Now everybody who has a view uh, can uh, sell his or her view uh, uh, on the internet and create uh, bubbles and create, uh, as we've seen, uh, uh, conspiracy theories. So, and uh, and that, of course, is also available to political parties and to leaders. So my, my pessimistic assumption is that uh, we will be seeing more, not less polarization. We will see uh, in uh, coming years and decades, no disappearance of populism. But again, for the for the next few years, I would uh, assume we will have uh, some kind of a bit of a setback uh, in the Western world because the United States will not uh, be popu uh, populist governed, but governed by a rational president and a rational administration. You know, I think that. Uh, globalization is not uh, something that happens because of a, a, a certain policy by governments. Globalization is a necessity for companies that are trying to to uh, uh, to be effective. Uh, in other words, I don't think that uh, globalization will disappear. I do believe that with respect to certain goods, uh, countries are now learning from the pandemic that uh, that there is um, uh, the need uh, to have uh, uh, to be to be in charge of, of of certain products and and value chains chains. So there may be some uh, reduction uh, of uh, globalization with respect to. Uh, certain important products such as pharmaceutical products, for example, leaving aside uh, leaving aside uh, 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 arms and 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 uh, and military equipment. I do believe, in order just uh, in order to respond to your question, I do believe that uh, whatever happens with globalization in coming years, we will unfortunately have more, not less, inequality. And that, of course, uh, will be one of the lasting and terrible consequences, secondary consequences of the pandemic. We, uh, the Munich Security Conference, will be publishing a, a, a lengthy report next week um, where we demonstrate to what extent uh, the secondary effects of the pandemic will, is likely to create failing states in Africa, is likely to produce more, not less, radicalization in poor countries, uh, whether it's in the Middle East or in, uh, in Africa, uh, uh, that there will be more hunger, more disease, uh, less co combat uh, uh, against malaria because uh, resources will tend to be focused, look at the rescue package of the European Union, which is a rescue package for us, for Spanish, Germans, Polish and other people. It's not a rescue package for the folks in the Congo uh, or in Kenya or in the Senegal. 
So uh, I'm afraid that there will be a rising inequality uh, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and rising conflict uh, and, and, and more failing states. And, and that will create more uh, uncertainties and volatilities uh, for, uh, for international security uh, in uh, coming years and maybe even decades. So on that, with that uh, view, I'm really quite uh, worried about the long-term secondary effects uh, of the pandemic. Russia has, uh, I mean, let me, let me make two or uh, three very brief remarks on Russia. First, what we also always need to uh, remember when we discuss uh, the role of Russia is that economically speaking, uh, the GDP of Russia is uh, only slightly more than that of Spain, for example. Uh, in other words, uh, if Spain is not an economic superpower, Russia is also not an economic superpower, right? Uh, so we should not overestimate, we should not overestimate uh, Russia. Russia has been exceedingly successful in leveraging its significant military power, which is why Russia has made advances in Ukraine, uh, militarily speaking. Russia has made advances in 2008, already 12 years ago. In Georgia, uh, Russia is demonstrating as we speak that it is still the master of the Caucasus by having just negotiated a ceasefire between Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, with Russian peacekeepers uh, already deployed overnight uh, in, in, in the region. So Russia is really very, very good in leveraging its own uh, role on the world uh, stage uh, with help of its military capabilities. But quite frankly, I think that in the 21st century, in the longer term, strategically speaking, what will matter is not only how many tanks or airplanes or even nuclear missiles you have. What will matter in the 21st century in the longer term is um, whether you uh, can adapt your country, your population to the enormous and dramatic technological changes, um, whether you can build alliances. Um, now, we in Western Europe, uh, with the European Union, with NATO, we are very comfortable with alliance, with integration, uh, etc., with, with cooperation, with working together. How many uh, countries has Russia been able to, uh, to assemble in a, in a kind of sustainable longer term alliance? Uh, I see only very few. So I think Russia has serious weakness, weaknesses, not only because it is, it is a, an economy essentially built on the sale of fossil fuels, which also doesn't really have a long term future ahead of itself. Uh, Russia has significant weaknesses, but it has been very good in leveraging its military power. Let me say that. So uh, my, my view is that in the foreseeable future, as we see a multitude of additional conflicts, potential conflicts, continuing conflicts, Russia will continue to play a significant role because it has something which we in the EU don't have, political will, capability, uh, and, the, and the potential to use military force uh, and to insert themselves into regional conflicts. Well, let me start with the, uh, with the international institutions. Reforming is, international institutions is difficult to do. Because generally speaking, you need a consensus among the members of such institutions. My hope, for example, that uh, we could uh, arrive at a reform decision regarding the UN Security Council, which is overdue, which has been overdue for the last 30 years or so. My hope is very limited. 
So I'm, I'm rather pessimistic regarding uh, reforming the existing international institutions, whether you talk about uh, the UN, whether you talk about uh, the World Bank, uh, whether you talk about OSCE, for example. Uh, the only area where I think there is room for reform and, and continuing search for, uh, for better ways to move forward is in our own European Union, where we have, of course, uh, revised our treaties every few years. And even as we speak, there are discussions about <clears throat> the next phase uh, of the uh, European Union. So there I'm a little less skeptical. Rebuilding multilateralism, you know, it's a different question. Um, in my book, multilateralism, you know, is, is a method. It's not a policy. Multilateralism is, is an approach. Uh, which is the opposite of a, a, a national strategy. You, you try to find uh, allies and friends to approach a certain problem. Um, multilateralism works if there is a policy that drives multilateralism. For example, <coughs> if, if we in the European Union define our approach to Africa as a policy driven by the method of multilateralism. We want not only the members of the European Union, but we want uh, friends and partners like Canada, the United States, well, maybe even China and, uh, and, uh, and other countries to participate in a multilateralist approach in order to prevent more failing states from, uh, from existing. Um, I am happy to say that uh, uh, my own country and, and others have, of course, committed themselves to the method of multilateralism, but it is always a question how effective such multilateralist alliances are if there is no strong leadership and if there is not a, uh, not a clearly defined policy, some, uh, quite often multilateralism remains a rhetorical instrument and a pledge uh, without much effectiveness on the ground. Can we, uh, uh, can we build uh, uh, on multilateralism? Uh, to what extent can the health, global health crisis offer an opportunity? I think that um, we in the, at, at the Munich Security Conference, we organized as recently as 10 days ago a um, virtual roundtable with senior decision makers on global health. I was trying to say that we've, we've just organized uh, 10 days ago um, a, a large roundtable with very senior participants, including the Director General of, uh, w, uh, of, of uh, WHO, um, etc. Because we believe, and I certainly believe, that global health offers itself as one area where, in fact, we can uh, uh, organize constructive cooperation, including with countries with which we have huge problems in other areas at the time. For example, with Russia. Uh, I uh, invited to this recent discussion on global health, uh, senior Russian participants. And of course, as we all know, uh, Russia has already developed its own vaccine. Uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is an interesting uh, capacity and ability in Russia in the field of medical uh, research. So I think that uh, global health is one of these uh, few areas uh, which offer a promising opportunity to remind people that global cooperation, specific cooperation on, on, on cer in certain fields can be and, and will be beneficial to all. So absolutely, I, I think there is a great opportunity and we will, with the help of the, by the way, with the help of a number of companies and uh, foundations like the uh, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, 
uh, we will continue to uh, organize discussions about global health. We've done this for the last five years, long before the pandemic. Bill Gates spoke about the, the risks of a, of a global pandemic at the Munich Security Conf in, uh, Conference in 2017. But you know what? Uh, no one listened. I mean, everybody listened, but no one took any action, which is uh, really a terrible conclusion. If uh, we had seen the world taking some precautionary measures after the warnings issued by Bill Gates, then we would be in a significantly better position today. So there are good lessons to be learned from this. I'm quite hopeful that uh, if and when the United States will uh, rejoin uh, uh, the uh, uh, those who have signed on to the Paris Climate Accord, uh, there will be uh, uh, a renewed push uh, for global climate action. I think that, in the views in the views of not only German voters is seen as the most pressing and most uh, important long-term challenge to our well-being and security. So I'm 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 somewhat more optimistic with regard to climate. I also believe, quite frankly, that the European Union uh, is learning interesting and positive lessons from the pandemic. As we speak today, uh, the EU Commission is examining uh, ways to construct the EU as a health union, which it was not uh, before. Um, and of course, the decision taken before the summer uh, by the European Union uh, that would allow the taking of debt uh, uh, in order to create the, the reconstruction uh, to, to make available the 750 billion reconstruction money, that also was a major step forward for the European Union. You know, quite frankly, I believe in, this, in the old sentence, never waste a crisis. And I think the European Union uh, has taken some interesting steps to benefit and to learn uh, and, and to make progress coming out of the crisis. Well, in a very fundamental way, Joe Biden and his administration will uh, make it uh, rely on partners and allies. That is, uh, that has been said so many times by Joe Biden himself and by his advisors. So it will, uh, he will certainly not repeat what Donald Trump said when he spoke of the European Union as a foe of the United States. I think Joe Biden believes that we uh, in the EU are his best partner uh, and he will want to work with uh, Europeans and certainly with Asian and other uh, partners and allies much more closely. So there will be a renewed push by the Biden administration to, uh, uh, to, to arrange for cooperative approaches but we should not but we should not kid ourselves we should not have illusions uh, the biden administration will be under enormous domestic pressure remember 70 million people voted for donald trump 70 million people voted for donald trump uh, they will not disappear and there will be enormous pressure in the us congress uh, to uh, not to discontinue the idea of America first, and it will not so, not be so easy for 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 Joe Biden to say yes. Of course, we will now negotiate a new contract with the Iranian mullahs. Uh, there will be enormous resistance against uh, these types of policies uh, in, uh, uh, in in the American public, political elite, and certainly in the Congress. So. We should not uh, have any illusions. Uh, uh, Joe Biden will be a good partner for us, but he will not be able to perform miracles uh, and he will be limited in his capacity 
to move in our direction. So maybe if we want to have a good transatlantic relationship, we will need to move a little bit in his direction in order to uh, allow him to be a good and, and, and interesting and important partner of the European Union. I think the pandemic is not likely to disappear even if we get the vaccine uh, vaccines which have now been promised in, in, in coming weeks or months, uh, maybe a little earlier than, than, than had been predicted uh, 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 until recently, uh, the, the pandemic will, uh, will keep affecting our countries well into the next, will be felt probably even more in Europe than in, in the United States, because traditionally the U.S. economy has demonstrated over and over again that uh, it is capable of a quicker rebound, quicker rebound than uh, European uh, economies for a variety of, of, of reasons. Mm -hmm. If you are, uh, as I am, uh, a diplomat, I mean, in my case, a semi-retired diplomat, you can only be a good diplomat if you are, in principle, an optimist. Uh, uh, you have to believe in the capacity of governments and institutions to deal with, uh, with the problems of today and, and certainly of tomorrow. So I, I uh, think that uh, we should not forget that for the last 50 or 60 years, uh, and the important books have been written about this, the world has actually made enormous progress. Uh, we have not had a major war, a major war uh, 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 between, you know, major powers in, in many, many years. The numbers of victims of, of wars uh, have gone down. Unfortunately, the number of refugees uh, 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 and displaced persons uh, have gone up in, in recent years. But those uh, many, many hundreds of millions of people who have been lifted out of extreme poverty. Uh, this is uh, important to, to note in India, in China, uh, and elsewhere. So I think, uh, you know, the news that we're looking at today and in the longer term are not only negative. Uh, and I think there will be a successful, uh, intensified effort in the climate protection uh, area. I hope that there will be a, re a resumption of, uh, 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 of arms control discussions, uh, including on, on nuclear arms be between uh, the United States, Russia, and hopefully uh, uh, other nuclear powers. So, if, and I hope that we, we in Europe can make an important contribution to strengthening uh, international institutions and to, and to uh, reanimate uh, a rules-based international system where, you know, uh, uh, it's not military power that decides uh, the future, uh, but uh, the, the rule of law and, uh, and democratic decisions. I'm quite hopeful that if the European Union can, can develop into a more capable foreign policy actor, speaking with one voice, we can actually be a very important driver for a world that looks a lot better in 20, 2030 or in 2040 than it looks today at the end of 2020.